Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Mukesh. I'm from Cheese Photography Magazine. Um, welcome to another webinar from Cheese. Today, we are excited to have Beth from USA. Uh, she would be walking through her work, her journey, and tips and tricks about uh, underwater photography. Uh, uh, Beth, please. Uh, carry on. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I hope you guys are doing well and everybody's staying safe and healthy. Um, uh, as nice introduction, my name is Beth Watson. I live in uh, Salem, Missouri, which is right in the central part of the United States. I'm landlocked. I, I don't really dive at home. So um, I primarily go to Indonesia, maybe in the Philippines and the Caribbean. So what I'm going to do today is um, tell you a little bit about how I got started in the underwater photography, a little bit about myself. Then I have a two minute slideshow to uh, show you some of my work. And then we will hop into my presentation, which is titled Shooting Wide Angle, A Path to Freedom. It was a coincidence that I started diving and underwater photography at the same time. I received my first digital camera in 2001. And this is the same year that I started diving. So it was just kind of natural when I started diving to take my camera underwater. And the uh, photography really inspired me, a creative outlet. I really enjoyed uh, taking the images, editing them on a computer, and then printing them out. So this uh, underwater photography became my hobby, and it really was my hobby until 2007. And at this year, this is the first image I took back then that I actually liked. I didn't know why I liked it, but as you can see, it has catch lights in the eye, and there's a lot of negative space. And years later, I, I'm a big fan of negative space, and I think it really works well in a lot of, a lot of images. It wasn't until 2012, after my first trip to the Philippines, that my underwater hobby really escalated into my passion. I was in the Philippines and talking to a friend, and we were looking at my imagery and she said, Beth, what do you do with your, with your pictures? And I said, well, I really don't do anything with them. Well, she really encouraged me to get my work out there. So I came home from the Philippines and I built my, a website. I started uh, sharing on social media platforms, but more importantly, I began entering print and photography competitions. And these competitions really helped and developed my, and was instrumental to my development as a photographer, to sit there and listen to judges critique my work and works of my uh, fellow photographer friends was really um, what really kind of really got me interested and really helped me, my path in, in photography. Uh, these competitions, this is the result of the last few years. Um, I was very fortunate and I used to do that. I don't really enter many competitions anymore and I, I apologize, my slide uh, just skipped really quickly there. Um, with my photography, I, um, I stay motivated by continually experimenting with lighting and different photography techniques, different lenses, different configurations. Um, it, it really keeps me inspired to try to, to do different things. When you look at my imagery, you, I want to invoke your imagination and your emotions. If you have to look twice at one of my images to figure out what it is, that's fine by me. But ultimately, what I would like to do is encourage individuals to um, conserve and preserve our ocean environments. Now what I have is a, it's about two and a half minutes slideshow and it, it's not all about wide angle imagery. It has some macro, it has some creative images, and it has uh, some wide angle. So I hope you enjoy it, and I hope it plays well for you there in, in India. Um, and then we'll hop into the presentation titled Shooting Wide Angle.
image is um, kind of indicative to what I was talking about. You have to look twice to, to figure out what it is. That was an image I took in the Philippines early one morning as the sun was coming up over the horizon. Okay, the, uh, the title of my presentation is Shooting Wide Angle, A Path to Freedom. In the last several years, I've been focusing primarily on wide angle uh, images. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love macro and I started off shooting macro and I still enjoy it. But there's something about shooting wide angle that really clears my mind. It's rewarding, it's relaxing, and it does give me a sense of freedom. You, um, when you're shooting macro, I don't know how many of you are actually photographers or even scuba divers, but when you're shooting macro images, you uh, look around in the sand for small things, very, very small critters, and you obviously take pictures. And a lot of times when you're diving, if that's all you're doing, you will miss a lot of things. You will miss uh, maybe some pelagics swimming by, or, or you just you just don't see as much as you do if you're shooting macro. So what I want to do is encourage people, if you are underwater, if you're a diver, if you're a scuba diver, photographer, to try to shoot wide angle imagery. It's, uh, it's a little more difficult to get started, but once you do, I think you will really enjoy it. And it, it will give you a whole nother perspective on diving if you start to shoot wide angle images. What I want to do today is um, share with you some of my strategies and techniques for shooting wide angle imagery. Um, and I want to encourage you to give it a try and hopefully you will take away one or two ideas or techniques and you can apply them to your underwater uh, imagery. And if you're already a seasoned shooter, I hopefully that you can expand on what you already know and take your photography skills um, to the next level. Creativity. Um, when you're creating an image, you want to engage the viewer. You want their eye to go into the image, move throughout the image, and stay in the image. Because once your eye leaves the, the image, chances are it's not going to uh, go back in and you will lose the viewer's attention. Um, if, if you can visualize what you want to create before you create it, that is very, very helpful. A planning and preparation is the key. This is one of those images I had to plan and prepare for. Things, they just don't happen. You make them happen. Um, I wanted to get up early before the sun came up and get in the water. And this was the sun was coming up over the horizon and it was in the Philippines. I had to get it the night before I had to get my gear set up. I had to figure out what time I was getting up, where I was getting in the water, because it, would, it was dark when I got in the water. There were rocks. I didn't want to stumble and fall. My camera equipment is, is big. It's heavy. Um, ab above water, it's very, very heavy. Underwater, it's, it's very easy to maneuver. But my point is planning and preparation is the key. And the thing is, if you plan and prepare, you will actually create your own luck and you can create some, some different type of images. Um, composition is obviously a, a major factor in, in photography. Some of you guys will have an eye for composition, but a lot of you will struggle with, with composition. And what I would recommend to do is look at work with whom other photographers whom you admire. It could be underwater photographers, topside, landscape, whatever. And what do you like about their work? What inspires you? And then take that information and don't necessarily emulate them, but, but apply that to your own and create your own style. Use it as an inspiration for you. And it is possible to create your own style because years ago I, I, I read that and I thought that would never happen. But apparently it has for me, I'm kind of um, the circular fisheye, uh, this is a circular fisheye shot, and it's the lens that creates this image. It's an eight millimeter to 15 millimeter, and at eight millimeter, it creates this. It's not photoshopped. And then when you zoom out, it's uh, rectangle. Uh, it's not really rectilinear, but it's rectangular image. So it is kind of it is possible to create your own style. 
um, choosing a subject. When you're shooting wide angle images, you need to be very selective because there's so many things to shoot. Um, you want something with that's striking, that's a good composition that really stands out. Then when you find something, it's really important to spend time with it. Don't just snap one or two pictures and move on. You need to really work the subject. Um, and a big thing is when you're diving, I don't know if you're familiar, but if you do in a wall dive, a lot of times you're in a group and you're following a group of people. And you, this is a big a Gorgonian fan, and it was probably probably as tall as I am. If, if not, it was, it was massive. And this was the back side of the fan. I actually approached it from the other direction. So what you need to do is make sure you turn around and look behind you when you're diving. Don't always just stay focused ahead because this was a much uh, more beautiful view from behind the direction I was coming. Then when you find a subject, shoot it from different angles. Shoot it from, uh, you know, up, down, and you know, diff different angles, Turn, tilt your camera. Just some subtle movements of your camera can really make a big difference in the composition in, of an image. When we're diving, the most important thing is safety. And I would really encourage everybody to ask these questions when they're underwater. What's the current? You typically want to shoot into the current if you can, because it makes things easier. You can stabilize yourself better shooting into the current. What's my depth? How much air do I have left in my tank? You know, there's a lot of times that we're halfway into the dive, 45 minutes into the dive, and, and there's something down deeper we want to go to maybe take a picture of. Well, you have to learn to cut your losses because safety is the most important things, and sometimes you just have to give up the shot, and you have to be smart. And, um, and ask yourself these questions. And if you do this on a regular basis, it will be just become part of your diving routine. And just be, it will become second nature to you. Uh, buoyancy is, is critical to diving and to the underwater photographer. It, it's imperative that you have the ability to be able to go in and capture the shot and get out without disturbing the environment or the subjects. And probably more importantly, when you're shooting macro, because when you're shooting macro images, you're down close to the sand or this, uh, the reef. And you just really need to, to have proper control of buoyancy and your breathing. Um, and it's your responsibility as a diver and a photographer to, to become really proficient at, at your buoyancy. And in, respect and uh, respect your uh, subjects and, and the environment. There you go. It is. It's, it's very true. Diving is, is all about diving and, and being a photographer is, is secondary. Um, I recommend if you start diving to not take a camera underwater until you are really proficient and are a really good diver. It's, it's just so important. Painting with light. Light um, creates the mood and feel of an image. Uh, the light, artificial or uh, uh, ambient, it brings out the colors. And the, the angle of the light, that is coming into the image, uh, that creates the textures and shadows, and it gives it, it's what gives the image a three-dimensional look. And when you learn how to, sh you need to learn how to shape the light, and once you figure that out, it really will um, take your to image making to, to the next level. Um, this is uh, lighting the scene. When we do wide angle imagery, we, we usually have two strobes. Actually, sometimes I use three strobes and we want to put artificial light on the reef or our subject. And, and when we apply that light, that is what brings out the color. To the naked eye, it's not this colorful underwater, but the actual color when you apply the light will bring out these colors. Because the first color we lose underwater is red. 
So I, uh, at uh, 15 feet, 30 feet, it, the red is completely gone. And then it just, it, it goes. Um, but the biggest problem or the biggest challenge, I guess I should say, of an underwater photographer is uh, lighting the scene. Strobe placement, you know, uh, the, the, the tip is you want to choose a selection of your subject is, is key. Because if you choose a subject that is parallel to your camera lens, for example, on the left, you can see this was in the Philippines and I was swimming around and there was this balmy and all these antheas, those little orange fish, they were all on the same plane, on the same level. And I knew it was going to be very easy to light this scene because everything was on the same, same plane. And on the right, this was actually Komoto, um, Indonesia. You can see when you have more depth to the image, the, the fish in the back are, are not lit. I mean, the image looks fine, but I just wanted to illustrate that if you choose something that's parallel to your camera lens, you will not get the dark areas. Right? Uh, another thing is a camera angle. So if you, excuse me, if you have a, a good scene that you want to light, tilt your camera different ways. Make sure that your, your camera is parallel because just a subtle movement of your camera and your strobes can make a big difference. And there's sometimes you will, I will see a scene and it's, it's stunning. I really want to take an image, but I know from experience that I'm not going to be able to light it properly. So in that case, I just record it in the, in my memory and I just, I just go on. But, but then when I find a scene that I want to spend some time with, then I, then I do that. Sometimes you just have to know, you learn through experience what will make a good um, image and, and what will not. Because the key on this stuff is, is lighting on the wide angle images. This is a quote, um, light makes photography, embrace light, admire it, love it. But above all, no light, know it for all you are worth and you will know the key to photography. That was um, George Eastman, Eastman Kodak Company. I don't know, you guys are probably part of that. Um, Excuse me. It uh, lighting is uh, photography is all about the light. No matter whether you're underwater, topside. Let me. Sometime when you're out, when we get to get out, right? Um, if you're out, look, look at something that grabs your attention. Is it a statue? Is it a painting? Is it what is it? And sit and study that. What is it that you're attracted to? And a lot of it will have to do with the lighting, not only the subject itself, but it's the way that subject is lit. Is the light coming from the top? Is it coming from the side? Is it backlit? Is it ambient light? Is it artificial light? Is it both? And if you do that and you can make a game out of it, you will start to figure the cause and effect relationship between that. And what's going to happen is you're going to figure out where the light's coming from. And once you start figuring that out, you can apply that underwater. Your photography skills are going to really uh, go to the next level because it's going to be so easy to um, look at the shadows and, oh, if I, light, if I turn my strobe this way, this is what's going to happen. If I apply two lights, this is what's going to happen. So I encourage you to try this when you're out and are at home, wherever. And uh, you're going to be amazed when you start seeing the light, how your photography skills will improve. Um, <clears throat> Post-processing. I could talk about this all day, but um, I encourage you, if your camera has the ability to shoot raw images, I please shoot raw images. Uh, do not shoot JPEG images because what happens with the JPEG, as in the preview on the back of your camera, JPEG images are uh, edited images and actually you're uh, uh, throwing away information. If you shoot a raw image, you're going to have a lot more uh, your dynamic range. You're just going to have a lot more information to use, although you do have to process these images. It's like a digital negative. You have all this information. You need to sharpen. You need to do some color correction. 
So um, I would encourage you to develop some kind of a workflow that suits you. Some people don't enjoy editing. Some people do. I, I like to edit. I, I like the whole process of it all. I like to capture the image on, and then I like to edit it. And then not so much anymore, but I used to do a lot of printing. And then to watch something come out of my printer that matches what I see on my screen is just, it's just really a good thing for me. I really enjoy that. And as I, I look at editing as um, a way to replicate what I see through the viewfinder, because I, for you, maybe some of you that don't know anything about underwater photography, when you see a scene, it's very, very difficult to capture that scene because you have to have your set your camera. Am I gonna expose for the highlights? Am I gonna expose for the, for the shadows? You need a happy medium in there. And with the water, the density of the water and everything, there's a lot of elements that come into play that maybe don't necessarily apply to topside photography. I have a viewfinder that is, a, it's an extension and it's a, a 45 degree viewfinder and it magnifies, thank goodness, everything underwater and the clarity and the colors I see through the viewfinder are really stunning sometimes, especially in, in shallow water, when I'm in the shallow waters doing um, wide angle photography. And when I take the image, as most of you know that a lot of times your raw image does not look like the scene because it's muted colors. It's And I personally set everything for very neutral because I don't want the camera doing any processing necessarily on my images. I just want to capture that raw image. And then I want to bring it into Lightroom, into Photoshop. And then I want to do with it what I want to do. So um, another thing I would encourage you to get online. There's so much information at your fingertips. There's really no reason not to learn how to edit. Um, I started shooting raw. My first uh, camera, digital camera was a Canon G2 back in 2001, and it shot raw images back then. And it was really difficult to find information. I could, but there was hardly any information on editing raw images that much because digital photography was just kind of get, getting rolling. And, um, and I, I, but today you just can get all sorts of information. So there's really no excuse. And take advantage of it because there's so much, there's so much, there's a wealth of information out there. You just have to go find it and then apply it. Okay, I think they want uh, to stop. This is about halfway and uh, have some question and answer time. And then we'll go into some of my favorite, favorite underwater shooting techniques. So does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Beth, for the presentation. And get to see some amazing images which you have created. Uh, one of the question which we have, um, is there any professional course available for underwater photography? Um, I know you might not be aware about India, but in general, are there some institutes that are teaching underwater photography only? There are actually, <clears throat> I know down in the, in the Bahamas, I, I have a couple friends and they, they do this for a living. You can go down and um, spend however long you want and, and take classes and courses with them, uh, kind of a hands-on. There's a lot of underwater, I've done it actually myself, a couple workshops where we go on a trip for a week or 10 days and I, I teach you how to shoot. I, I help you edit your images. Um, I've done that. There's a lot of people that do that. Um, there are a couple schools that you can go to um, you can get a lot of information online. You can take, I, I don't know as many classes per se as there would be um, like on YouTube and things like that, but there are a lot of avenues. And if anybody ever needs anything, they can send me a message or something. I'll be glad to, to personally, you know, provide you with some, um, some links, you know, for what, depending on your skill level and what you want to learn as far as a camera. What I can say about a lot of it is, um, Practice above water. Practice, I do a lot. I used to, especially with macro photography, I would practice on my kitchen table because if you cannot, if you can't do it above water, you're not going to be able to do it below water. 
Okay. I got off topic there a little bit. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh -huh. We have another question from Pranav. He's asking, sure. is there any difference in post-processing compared to uh -huh. the regular photography and uh, under, underwater photography, which you do? Um, that's a very good question. Um, yes. I mean, the, everything is basically the same as far as, you know, your techniques and everything. But there are uh, issues that we have in underwater photography that you do not have topside, such as you will have backscatter. I don't know if you're familiar with backscatter is, but when you use strobes, um, if you don't have them positioned correctly, you really actually want to light what's, you want to feather your strobe so the edge of the light hits your subject. Because what happens is there's particulate matter in the water floating around and your strobes will light that matter up and back, come back in and capture that and record that on your camera sensor. And it can be a mess. You can have a, a beautiful image and have all these white spots all over your image. So strobe placement is critical. And there's sometimes that you, you can't avoid it. It's just in the water. Or if the water is very murky or if the visibility is not good, you're going to have murky water. So that's an issue. You have to learn how to, you know, get those out. And, and a big issue that we have in underwater photography is especially if you don't have the strobes lighting your subject, you have a lot of cyan in your images. You have that blue look. So there's techniques and special little things that you can do in Lightroom and in Photoshop to remove that and get that back to the original color and, and to remove that cyan. And there's a couple other things, uh, you know, to remove the, the, the backscatter. And those are probably the two biggest things that are a, an issue. Another thing is we, uh, we lose red as the density of the water. Red is the first color we, we lose. So a lot of times, especially with ambient light pictures, you need to go in and increase the saturation of the reds. So that would be the top three things I would think that would, um, issues that you have. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a question from Rahul. Okay. Uh, to know if there is an approach uh, which we can follow so that the fish, they don't get scared or any, any other creature, you know, like not to disturb their habitat and you go take pictures and come out. That's really, that's really a good question. And that's very important. And that's, a, and I really, I'm glad he, he asked that. Be calm. All right. I, I'm a very hyper person. Just that's the way I am above water. I'm all over the place underwater. I'm a different person. I'm calm. I love it underwater. And they sense that the fish, whether it's a small uh, fish or a, a big manta ray or the sharks or whatever, they sense if you're if you're nervous um, and calm. That's probably the, the, the biggest the biggest issue is just being slow underwater, not jerky. Um, and a lot of times, for example, a schooling fish, if you get um, if you swim parallel to them as opposed to swimming right into them, because a lot of times what they do is they're scared of the bubbles. That's what's scaring them off more than anything are the bubbles that are coming up from your from your regulator as you exhale. But I have found if you if you swim parallel with if there's a group of fish and swim parallel and then you can swim maybe a little bit closer and still swim parallel to them, they don't feel intimidated and they won't swim off. Um, and another another tip is to just hang there and watch them sit there and lit, or for a while. And when they come, become accustomed to you, then you can go in. Same thing with mackerel subjects. If you have, let's say, a little mantis shrimp that's coming out of a hole, um, they'll come out, they'll peek out, they'll go back in, they'll peek out, they'll go back in. So if you get your camera set up and just kind of sit there and wait for them, eventually they're going to come out. A lot of it's just patience. You have to be very patient, especially with the macro photography. I know we're talking uh, primarily wide angle, but it, it's it, it's applicable to both, really. The wide angle scenes are kind of a little bit different, but you really need to be patient and good diving techniques. I mean, just still the buoyancy. Um, I I don't. I mean, I'm not a fan. I don't move subjects. Um, I, I shoot them as they are. In their in their natural surroundings and habitats. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, 
have another question from Dr. Vikramji. First of mm -hmm. all, thank you, doctor, for serving us and helping our community. And yes, the really appreciate it. Very much so. Okay. The question from Dr. Vikram is, uh, what are the preparation to be done in terms to know the habitat before going and shooting? Like, are there some resources uh, to find out uh, what all what to expect? Yes, that's, that's another excellent question. Um, yes, um, what you can do is you can research the subjects that you want to to sh capture. So. For example, Antelao Philippines is a very good place to go and capture macro critters. So if you get online and wherever you're staying too, a lot of times the resort or the, or the place they will have information on their website, or you can go in and, and just Google the critter itself, find out the habitat, the species, you know, what they live and where they eat. That's the main thing. Your dive guide, you'll have a dive guide that will go and take you around whether you're shooting macro or wide angle and show you different things. Well, there's specialists in finding those things and the, the, the species that they can find, they are experts and they know what these animals live, where they live, what they eat. And that's the key on, on finding these things because a lot of them, they're always in the same location. And some of these things that I shoot, especially in macro photography, I mean, we're talking minute, we're talking I mean, with the naked eye, some of the stuff I can't even see with the naked eye. And I have a diopter and I have uh, special lenses that, that can capture these. And um, that's important. Um, there's a lot of information. And if you get to pelagic species, the same thing applies. You can learn about them. Um, but, but again, where you dive, they will take you to and give you the best opportunity to see what you want to see. Right. But it's very good and very helpful for you to know in advance, though, what, what where the habitat is and, and where these things live. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have um, one more question. Uh, this fine. is a very basic question, which That's fine. Uh, we were expecting. How you lit a uh, subject in the light? The question is like, how do you take light inside the water? What are the okay. different to cover? Yeah. I wish I had my camera. I could go get my <laughs> my um my strobe you can actually. Get it nearby you can get it. you can grab yeah. it. Yeah. What? I'm sorry? If it is okay. there in this room, you can grab your camera or anything you want to show. Yeah, I don't I mean it's upstairs, but I could take a maybe it's big. I mean it, it really is. Oh. My um I have a, it's not put together. I didn't even think of that. But maybe I should do that. It's an enclosed flash. It's like a maybe big. Maybe if you could show it on Google, if you could show it on Google, so that may help if that is possible. Otherwise, that's okay. So it where? Do you mean to go get it, my stroke? Um, no, no. I'm like, sorry, I didn't understand you, what you said. I'm sorry. Uh, you can show it on Google if that is something which you have available, or any other photo which you have. Okay. Otherwise, you can no, I could do that. I have some photos actually that I could find them and I could display them later at a later time. Yeah, because I have that. I did an article one time. I wrote an article about uh, shooting wide angle and strobe placements, and I have pictures of my camera setup. I will do that. I'll remind me and I'll, I will share that with you, and you guys can, can take a look because I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot of stuff that I take. So, um, getting back to your question, uh -huh. it, it's called a strobe. There's two different ways you can light something. You can light it with constant light, which is a like a video light, constant light, which I'm starting to get into vi underwater video now, um, or a strobe. And a strobe, it will create a flash. So it has a flash bulb on the inside. Mine weighs, I have, it's, the brand is Ike Light, and it's a 125, uh, or, one, or I'm sorry, 160 watt. And I have these and then I have a sync cord and it syncs down to my camera. And then when I push the shutter on my camera, it fires these strobes underwater. And strobe, um, you lose a lot of the power from the strobe because of the density of the water. So in reality, I have to almost, if I can't really reach out and touch my subject, I won't get any light on it. So all those beautiful colors that you see in, in my, most of the images, 
they are lit with a stroll. And I am very, that's one reason you need to have very good buoyancy and good technique diving because I have to get very, very close to these reefs. And you have to remember coral, it's all living subjects. I mean, these aren't, they are, they're, they're, everything's living. So you have to be very careful because if you touch something, a lot of times it, it will make it die, right? So we don't want to touch anything and be very, very gentle when we're going in to take, take images. And some of these images, I'm in little tight spaces or I'm, down underneath an overhang and I have these big strobes they're probably when I have them out they're you know that far out um and that's what lights the reef up and they, they go you know they, they 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 recycle within no time so I can take five or six shots very quickly and that's how the strobes work underwater and um there's a lot of different different um types of strobes but mine are very powerful and, and, and big. I'd like to get something smaller because for travel, they're just, it, it's a lot to take, but I'm used to it. So anyway, but that's how we get the light underwater is with the strobes. When you're yeah. in shallow water, you can do ambient light and you can get some nice images. But when you get deeper, more than, I don't know, your meters, probably nine meters to, to 10 meters, you lose your light. And you need you need the artificial light. Okay. Uh, Does that thank, make sense? Thank you. So uh -huh. uh, another question which we have uh, mm -hmm. is the difference between wide angle photography, which you specialize, or the general um, underwater photography. I, I'm sorry, you're asking the. Um, the difference between wide angle and macro? Yeah, is it yeah. a different genre of a photography? So macro we do understand, but wide angle, is it just using the particular lens? Oh, yes, that, that's correct. The difference between wide angle and macro photography is just the lens. So for example, underwater for my macro setup, I have, um, I use, I'm a Canon person. I, I shoot um, Canon 5D Mark IVs. And then I have uh, 100 millimeter, 2.8 is what I use for my uh, macro photography. And then to get the super magnification, I have a plus 23 diopter and I have a plus 16 diopter that I put on the front, which makes my working distance, for those of you that are familiar with what that means, very, very narrow. Um, and then for my wide angle photography for underwater, I have two lenses that I use. I use a eight to 15 millimeter circular fisheye, which is what a lot of these images are, and which I mentioned before at eight millimeter, it's circle. And it, the, the field of view of this circular fisheye, which is, you can see the image there, it's almost 180 degrees. It's, it's very, very wide. It encompasses, I mean, the, the whole scene. That's why I really like shooting it. And then when I zoom this lens out, it is um, 15 millimeters, which is the, the rectangular normal type image. Um, and a wide uh, fisheye lenses really work well underwater. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but the, the, they're, they're distorted. You know, above water, they're, they're really, sometimes you can't really apply them very well. Uh, the use is, is not that great above water, but underwater, it, they really lend themselves well. To underwater images and then the other uh, lens that i use underwater i have two um i have two uh, wide angles is a 16 to 35 and that's just your rectilinear normal wide angle lens so i really have one macro and then i have um, two wide angle lenses that i use and that's the only difference um, the wide angle is is just the lens and then you have to have different ports that go on the front of your housing to accommodate the, each lens. So there's different lenses. So I have three different ports that I use. I have one port that covers my wide angle lens and then an, actually two, a big dome port. And then I have a different dome port for my macro lens. So, but that okay. is the difference, it's just the lens. Uh, great, uh, thank you. Um, I have another question like, how much time it takes right when you reach to location till you are under 
water taking the pictures like oh okay time, putting up the gears all checklists you know like the workflow if you could describe in uh to us well that is that's another good question my um again it it, it kind of depends on the trip uh if i'm going to a land based um location uh, sometimes i i take that first day off and i just relax and i take getting my gear set up sometimes i go on what we call a liveaboard i don't know if you're familiar with that is that's a boat and i will live on the boat for the duration of the trip and i will dive off the boat and um there might be uh, anywhere from 12 to 16 people on the boat and the boat is just strictly for diving and we eat we sleep on the boat so it kind of depends on the trip but when i get to a location typically the first thing i do is of course unpack and i have lots of gear i bring everything with me except my tanks i have when i travel my husband usually travels with me but for example i when i travel on the airlines i have two 50 pound bags which is what your kilos 20 six kilo bags 24 kilo bags and then i have two carry-ons with a roller and then i have a, a big backpack and they probably weigh half that they probably weigh 10 15 kilos maybe each so i have a lot of gear and majority of it is scuba gear and it is my camera gear i have it's embarrassing sometimes when i travel how much i have but I travel to these locations halfway around the world if if I don't have it you know I can't use it and that's why I'm there because I go to these places and what I do now is I'm I create content I go and I create promotional imagery and I do some videos for their promotion for their marketing so I need to take everything with me right um but when I get to a location I usually say I usually unpack first and then I I depending upon where I am that they'll take your dive gear. A lot of times they'll have people working there in the resort or in the dive location and they will take your gear and they will set your gear up. You'll have a box where you put your uh, BCD in, your fins and all your dive equipment in there. Some locations will have a dedicated camera room where you can go in and set your camera up other places you just do it in the room where you stay most places these days have um a camera room of some sort because it's become very popular so then i take all my camera gear up to the camera room and then i assemble my my gear um and a very important thing i learned years ago a lot of people we like to talk when we're assembling our camera but i found over the years i i sometimes i put something in my mouth so i can't talk to people because i don't want to be rude but it's very important to put it together correctly because i've had two complete floods over the years and you're going to if you do underwater photography it's not if you flood your camera it's when you're going to flood your camera because it will happen no matter how careful you are some day if you do this long enough you will have an issue and get water inside your camera so i found out if i just kind of pay attention and really get my camera stuff set up the night before then i i have a lot better results um and sometimes very seldom do i dive the same day i reach a location a lot of times if i uh when i go to the philippines or when i go to indonesia from the us we fly and then we'll spend the night either in manila or i'll spend the night in jakarta something like that and then go the next day either another plane ride or a uh, whatever to the location and then when i get to the location sometimes it might be two or three days some of these places i go it it takes me four days to get there four or five plane rides and it, some of them are very remote um but when i get there very seldom do i dive the same day and we get our stuff set up and then typically then you relax that day and then you you go in the water the first thing the next day all right and then there your first dive of each trip usually is what we call a checkout dive and you go in some people take their camera some people don't you go in i always usually take my camera um you go in you check your equipment 
because you're very important because you've been traveling with all your equipment. You want to make sure your regulator and your everything's working properly. So that's what it'll do. And then you'll start your diving after that. So it just depends um, um, on the location, really. A lot of that. I'm sorry. In that, in that, in, we have a related yeah. question that one dive, how much time usually underwater? And second mm. question is, what are your usual sightings? Especially people are asking about the aperture. I'm sorry, uh, settings for my camera? Uh, I'm the sorry. settings of the camera, usually the aperture and uh, shutter speed, what, what usually oh, you Okay, have. sure. All right, that's, that's a good question. Um, the first part was how long a dive. For the most part, most dives are an hour. 45, 50 minutes to an hour. Sometimes if you're doing macro diving in some of these other locations, um, you dive longer. The longest dive I've done, I think, was two hours. I was shallow and we were doing a macro diving. But for the most part, an hour is about the time limit. Because a lot of these um, businesses or the dive uh, shops and things, they have a schedule. And they have, they have maybe four dives a day scheduled or three dives and four dives and a night dive. And they need to keep their boats on schedule. So you have a time limit. And also, you, most some people, I'm fortunately, I'm very good with my air consumption. So I can stay down longer than some people because some people, you know, they breathe heavier and they, 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 they're not as good with their air consumption. So that, that comes into play, too. My camera settings for wide angle, um, I call them my jump settings. And what that means is when I jump in the water, that's what my camera set. But I'm always changing my, my settings. I'm never... I never just set it and leave it. Same thing with my strobe positioning. I am constantly moving my strobes around. And that's what makes um, some of my stuff maybe a little bit different only because I like things differently and I'm not, you know, I try to get angles and I try to drape, drape, I'm sorry, create drama and um, some contrast and things like that. Um, my, my jump settings for wide angle, typically uh, one, 125th, 125th of the second. And the reason that is because I want to stop action. So example, like these fish you see on this image, they're schooling. Well, I want to stop the action. So I, I do that at one 125th of a second. My uh, shutter speed is typically F10. I mean, my aperture is F10. Um, I, like to, I like to have a more depth of field. And then my uh, ISO is usually about 160 because that's, that's the sweet spot for Canon. And then I typically go up increments, excuse me, increments of 160. So I go from 160 to 320 and then up there. Um, 640 is about the highest that I will use on my um, ISO underwater. But today the digital cameras are getting so much better and they have improved that you can um, shoot at a higher ISO but there's really no need to if you're using strobes. If you're doing an ambient light shot such as this one you see on the screen, strobes weren't used. So if you're using that, then it's, or you're, maybe you're shooting a wreck, uh, you know, a, a wreck underwater, which I actually don't do a lot of. I would like to do some more, but I don't have a, a, ter a lot of experience with that. But there again, you would bump up your ISO on a shot like that. But you typically want... As, as a normal topside photography, you want your ISO as low as you can possibly get it. And like I say, probably for 90 to not probably 95 percent of my images are shot at an ISO of 160. Okay. So okay. that's my top settings. But then uh, very quickly, you can throw all that out the window because if you want to drag the shutter, if you want to create, which I like to do that type of thing, and you want to create blur, which I do. Then it's the opposite, right? Or, or even on macro shots, macro um, images, a lot of times I'll shoot at 2.8 and sometimes I shoot at F25. It just depends on what I'm using and what I'm trying to create. So it's, it's very, you can be very flexible with it. And you need to have an open mind and you need to try different things. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, anyway, did that answer <laughs> your question? Yeah, yeah. It does, it does perfectly. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, we have another question from Alok. Um, what 
have been your like you've been shooting in manila in several locations you mentioned mm -hmm. that sometimes you had to change six or seven flights to these those locations what is your experience or are some most exotic location uh, as per you which you feel is okay um that's that's pretty easy for me i just got back from there actually uh right before everything got locked down it's, it's called raja ampat uh it's my favorite location in um as far as all around diving the healthiness of the reef it's it's in indonesia um uh, raja ampat is is really good philippines is very good diving too i, I like them both very very much but if I have to pick one spot, I would say Raja Ampat. They have a variety. Uh, if you saw my first image of the, the batfish, that was in the mangroves at Raja. They have uh, very beautiful corals. The marine life is just uh, the healthiness of the corals, and uh, it's stunning. And the topside photography as well. I do a lot of drone photography, and um, um, it's just just stunning. So that's that's my favorite. There's a lot of places I haven't been. The problem I have, I go to these places and I really like them and I go back and I go back and I don't have enough time to, to go to some new <laughs> destinations. So that's bad. I guess that's a bad problem, not a bad problem to have, but um, mine is, mine is Raja Ampat. So. Oh, great. Uh, we have another question. Uh, have you done any underwater photography other than ocean? Like which may be some lake or some pool or some. Honestly, yeah. um, no. I, I haven't. I, I, I say I'm a fair weather diver. Um, I'm spoiled in the fact that I, I, I don't like cold water. I mean, I have, I have some friends, they dive under icebergs and they do all this stuff. And I'm like, it's, it's too cold for me. Um, at home, we, I have some friends, they dive in the lakes around here and there's some, some caverns. And I, I just don't, I don't do that around here. I, I have to be honest. I have taken my camera and like practiced a time or two experimented so in a pool or something like that. But I, I usually, all my work is done on when I'm gone. So. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Rona. Um, mm -hmm. You had mentioned in previous part of your presentation about macro setup. Mm -hmm. uh, so two part of the questions, like what all the gears you take primarily, I guess you would be changing your lens to macro. And is it the different habitat for finding those macro subjects, or is the same place you decide to shoot them as a macro the same sorts? You're talking about macro and wide angle both? Is that the kind only, of um, the only the macro we are talking about? The question is about only about the macro photography, macro oh, setup. Um, okay, I see. Um I have a lot of, um, over the years, I spent a month in, in Anlao, uh, Philippines at Anlao Photo Academy. They invited me there to just mentor people and I got the ability to, to do whatever I wanted for, for a month, um, experiment. And I, I did a lot of different things with macro, for, and that was all macro photography for the most part. Um, as You start with the macro lens, but I, I make a lot of things, My I'm a DI why kind of girl? I like to make things. I've made a lot of different filters for macro. I've used a prism. I've shot reverse ring macro, whereas that's where you take the 100 millimeter macro on your lens. And then I put a second lens on it and we re actually reversed it and shot through the back of the lens. And what that does is it creates a very soft Obviously, the depth of field is very minute, but it's soft bokeh background, and you get these swirling effects of the background. Uh, there's a lot of different things. I, I've, I've, I've made filters to put on snoots and lights. I do a lot of snooting. I used to snoot all the time, and a snoot is um, something that directs the light. It's a very good technique to have, not technique necessarily. It's a, you have to have a snoot. I used to have a homemade snoot. Now I, um, I have, a, it's called a retra, R-E-T-R-A, underwater snoot. And what that does, it, it creates a black background. And you just highlight the subject. And it's a very good way to isolate your subject from the background. Because a lot of times the macro stuff is always on the sand for the most part. So that's what I try to find a subject that's perched up, something that is up off the sand so I can get down underneath and, and get a nice shot of it, of it 
on an upward angle because most everything macro, especially you want to shoot at an upward angle. You don't want to shoot your, your best. Um, it's not good to shoot directly down on your subject. You want to shoot, try to shoot parallel or underneath your subject. And to do that, it needs to be in a good location up on a, a, a piece of coral or up on a hydroid. I don't know if you know what that is, but um, something like that. And I have the different diopters. I have two different diopters I use for magnification for the for the macro. What else do I have? I have a lot of different things that I've made. I have a little bag. I've even taken uh, the last couple of years when I was in, in Anla, I had a prism, a glass prism that I, I shoot through um, and try, try to get some some effects. So I, I've done a lot of different just experiments. Some things work, some things don't. So you just have to, it's trial and error for me. And I, I love doing that, sitting down and, and thinking about trying to do something, something different. Um, the habitat, again, you, the key there is to, find, to have a guide that's familiar with the area and is um, knows the area. And most of them do. The lo they're mostly local guides wherever you are. And, and they're really familiar and very good at finding the critters for you. So typically what happens is they will find you a subject to shoot. This is for macro. And um, then you go shoot that subject and then they're hunting for another subject for you. And you might have a group. You may have your, I've had my, I've been in a group of, you know, four people. I've been in a group by myself. I've been in a group with 15 people. So it just depends on where you are, what kind of diving you're doing. But for, for macro, um, it's important to have a good guy because I, I've, I've done this a long time and I have a difficult time finding things. All right. My eyesight's not quite as good as it used to be either. So. Uh, great. This is something which I was not aware that you have attached to lenses. Mostly, I what I have seen people adding some tube, but you added two lenses. I'm sure you must have used some adapter connecting two lenses in the reverse order. It, yes. It, the, the trick of that was it wasn't as hard doing that as it was to fit it into my dome port. Because if, if, if you've ever done that technique, you know that, I mean, your working distance is just hardly anything. And you, what you do is you get a ring. It's very inexpensive. I think I bought it for just a dollar or two. It's, a, it's called a revert. It's a ring that you uh, screw onto the front of your lens that allows you to screw on both front lenses together. You know, and then you just screw it on and then it, it just hangs there. But the, the, the hardest thing for me was I have um, extension rings and I had to figure out what I used to be able to fit it in my housing because it had to fit right up against the glass part of the front of my housing so I could focus. Because if it's back too far in my housing, I won't be able to focus reverse ring macro. So I actually, what I did is I took an extension tube and I had different sizes and I just played with it till I got it so it fit just right. And then I was able to use it. And I really enjoy doing it. It's a lot of fun, but you, there again, a subject is very tricky because the depth of field is like, almost non-existent so you have to pick something that you know is really like an eye of something or maybe an egg an uh, anemone eggs are very good to use that on but mm -hmm. that's what you do and you can do it without stacking them i've done it i've done it on lots of different configurations i've done it with all my lenses i've used the reason i use the hundred just a little maybe more advanced but um i use the hundred millimeter macro lens because i can control the 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 aperture on that lens. Because when you reverse a lens, you have no control over the lens. It goes to whatever, if it's a 2.8, then you're gonna shoot 2.8 reversed. But what you can do is go into your cap to go into your lens and stop it down to like maybe F8, F10, take the lens off. The aperture will, will stop down. It won't revert back to whatever it is, 2.8. It will stay down and you then you can reverse it and it gives you a little more control. It gives you a little more depth of field, if that makes sense, doing it that way. But I found stacking the lenses using my 100 millimeter first, I could shoot it at F8. And then my and I used a 50 millimeter and I reversed the 50 on there. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, we have a follow-up question. You had mentioned that you've been using a drone as well at certain location. So is uh -huh. the drone related to underwater photography too, or is it uh, 
a separate genre which you follow? No, it's separate. It, it's it's just a normal, uh, just top side drone. And I use that to supplement uh, my content creating. I use that to, you know, to take pictures of the boats, the resort, you know, do little promo videos for them with the drone. Um, although they do have underwater drones. Actually, I was, uh, a company reached out to me, wanted me to try one out. And I'm, I'm like, no, I have way too much stuff to take. I just can't get into that, but there is, and it's becoming, I, I've never seen anybody use one, but they do have underwater drones now. And the, the, the problem I had with them, you have a, they're tethered, you know, they're, they, they have a, I don't know how it would work. I would afraid, I would be afraid it would get like up against the reef or something like that, but they are using underwater drones now. So that's a good oh, question. Oh, that's it. That's interesting. So underwater drone means mm -hmm. you don't have Near to the fish or other creature, you just control the camera from a distance, and you take Correct. picture. Actually, I, I believe you you control it topside, so it's like you would put the drone in the water, and the drone goes off, and then you're controlling it. But it's tethered, so I mean, how far you know? Maybe some of them are untethered now, but then how would you get you could get stuck very easily? So I don't know, but it's uh, interesting. It would be interesting to. Try. And um, another question which I had, do you carry two bodies underwater or two camera bodies or? No, I, I, I don't. I have, I, uh, no, I do have two camera bodies. Uh, typically what I do is I keep one top side and then if I want to take images of whatever and then I have one, I don't have to tear my camera apart to get into it, to, to get my, my camera out. Uh, no, but I have known people to do that and I have seen people do that. I actually have a friend from, he lives in Belgium and he had two camera and he had, a, they were both uh, a little positive buoyancy, which means they would float. So he would have one tethered to him that was floating. I mean, we're talking big system, two of them. So he had one for wide angle and one for macro, but no, I'm not that crazy yet. <laughs> That's too much, but it is possible. Some people do do that. And another option, another idea is, and I've thought actually about doing this, is taking, if I'm shooting wide angle, for example, to take a little compact point and shoot with me just to, if I needed it for whatever reason. But I, I haven't done that. But that would be more realistic than, than taking two camera bodies. Um, I, I, there, is a, there is a question uh, from Pankaj. How do you keep a track of time when you are underwater in then additional question is, do you communicate outside the water, any base station? Do you have any voice communication, like wireless or some communication? When, when I'm underwater? Yeah. No, um, you can. First of all, you have what's called a dive computer, and it's, it's a watch. Most, for the most part, it's a watch now. Sometimes it's a gauge, and it keeps track of your time. It keeps track of your depth. It keeps track of your air. So I, I have a, a big watch and I look at it and I can see how deep I am. I can see how much, because what happens is you get nitrogen in your system and it keeps track of your tissues and how much, you know, because you can't stay down there or you can get, it's called the bends. We won't get into that, but it can be dangerous. Diving is not, I mean, it's not dangerous, but it can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing and you have to be well trained. That's very important. Um, but no, I have a watch that lets me know my depth. And you have a certain dive profile. You can't just go up and down. You have to go down and then you have a, you, then you gradually go back up for the most part. Um, so um, what was uh, the second part of that question? Yeah. Oh, communications. Um, they do make, they're coming out with all crazy stuff now. I go to these dive shows and they have the, people you can talk to each other underwater, which personally, I don't want to do. I don't want to talk. I mean, that to me, that's uh, the big part of the diving is to be, you know, quiet and just, you know, I don't want to be talking to anybody underwater, but it, you can do that. They do have, they do have the equipment that you can talk. So. Uh, with the danger, there is a related question. Um, on the creature side, what danger you can expect? Uh, any dangerous creature like shark or any other, or, or any of your experience where you ended up with in certain situations? 
Well, well the, the biggest danger is, is probably yourself, to be honest with you. You have to be careful. And um, most of these you think of being dangerous there. It's just common sense, just using common sense. The biggest problem people have is when you touch something. Because a lot of these animals, especially the macro things, they're they're dangerous to the point of they can sting you, they can hurt. There's the stuff under the sand, and you don't know. And a lot of these things will have spines. And for example, I don't know. In my um, slideshow, there was a it was called a blue ring octopus, and it's about very small little octopus. It has blue rings on it, and it's the deadliest animal in the ocean. And, you know, people think of sharks and all this, but it's a little octopus. And I was up there within two inches of him taking a picture of him. But as long as you don't provoke them or you don't, you know, touch them, they're not going to bother you. Right? And um, but they're toxic and they're, they're toxins. And they, if, if they bite you, they, they can actually kill you. So I guess what I'm saying is, is sometimes it's the smaller things and there's things in the sand that they have these scorpion fish. They, they bury themselves in the sand and they have these very painful um, spikes on them. So if you inadvertently stick your finger in the sand, it's that type of thing that really could be more dangerous than, say, a shark. Right. So it's it's like. So that's what you have to watch out for. Or even some of there's these hydroids that they call them, they call them fire coral. And I've inadvertently touched one of them before. And oh, my gosh, it was terrible. Um, the, the pain, you know, goes away, but it, it's more of that type of thing you're going to come in, in con contact with than like an animal, right? Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. In while driving, any unusual subject you have come across or something species which was not known or anything treasure or something maybe? <laughs> no, no treasure. I, I did find a phone. I found a Samsung brand new phone in um, uh, Komodo. And it was a manta ray dive. And I don't know if you know what manta rays are. They're big um, uh, creature. They're just amazing to dive with. Anyway, uh, we were doing a dive for that. And I saw this brand, this brand new phone. It had a little plastic case on it. And I got it up and I thought it was going to charge, but to no avail, it, it didn't work, but it was a really a, a nice phone. Um, probably the rarest thing that I personally have seen, it was years ago, probably 20, I don't know, not 20, but 15 years ago, I was in Belize and um, there was an octopus out in the day. And then there was a moray eel, right? You know, moray eel is, well, all of a sudden I saw this moray go and they got into it. The octopus and the moray eel started fighting and they were fighting and twisting and turning and everything. And sand was going everywhere. Ink was going everywhere. The octopus was inking. And I had no idea who was winning the fight. But all of a sudden, poof, off the, um, the moray eel goes and here the octopus walks off. But the octopus didn't have a head. So, oh. and then the yellow, the yellow tails come up and started eating the octopus. So that was very, very rare behavior. The, the dive guide, he was, um, I forgot where he was from, but he said he's, he's done like 8,000 dives. He said he's never seen that behavior before. So fortunately it was my husband's first time diving with a video camera and he got it all on tape. So that's, that's kind of the most unique thing that I've ever seen. Um, so we are we have a lot of questions for you, but I guess it's time to have a remaining session of your slide. And okay. We will cover up if time allows. We will cover up cover up remaining questions. So guys, okay. if you have any question, please write, or you can raise your hand. We will try to take some voice questions too. Sure. And you can ask directly. Um, we are making a presenter now. You please. Okay. Uh, carry on with the remaining slide. And thanks, okay. Kathy. We have to do a lot of new things. Yes, I'm going to go through some of my favorite um, shooting techniques. Yeah, we don't, we don't have, I mean, I am i don't have that many more to go through, actually, 10 or, 10 or 12, I think. So, okay, 
I appreciate all your questions and they were such good questions. So if you guys think of whatever, I'll be glad to answer them when I'm finished. I'm going to go through um, what different things, uh, reflections, silhouettes, Snell's window, CFWA, which stands for close focus wide angle, over and under shots and sunray shots. So we're going to go through those. You can share your screen now. And uh, oh, I forgot to share my screen. Hold on. I have to. Wait a minute. Do I have to share my screen? Hold on. Share. Start sharing. Okay. Let me see. Let me go back to my keynote here. I forgot I had to share it back. Um, yes, we can see our screen now. All right. Let me go to play. All right. You should see. Okay. Favorite techniques. I'm going to go through a, a, a few of uh, my favorite shooting techniques for wide angle underwater photography. And we're going to start with reflections and go to silhouettes, Snell's window, CFWA, which is close focus wide angle, over and unders, and then sun rays. First of all, um, these are reflections and probably one of my most favorite things to shoot. I absolutely love to shoot reflections. First of all, they're very easy to shoot. They're fun. They're inspiring. They're thought provoking for the most part. And they're just they're just fun. Um, you have to choose. Obviously, you're in shallow water to be able to shoot the reflections and you need the, sh the water to be uh, calm and not choppy. Because if it, the more calm the water is, the more mirror like image you're going to get the reflective image. The thing is about when you're shooting reflections or even all wide angle photography, you really need to pay attention to your framing and check the perimeter of the image before you push the shutter because we don't want to crop these images because the whole idea of shooting wide angle is to capture as much as, as uh, of the scene as we can. So um, I would encourage you to just really check the perimeter of the scene to make sure there's no unwanted bubbles or anything like that. This is a good example that we go back to my lenses. Um, this is the same lens. This is my eight to 15. The top left is uh, the eight millimeter, which is, that's how it comes out of the camera. It's not Photoshopped. Um, and then on the right bottom is the same scene when the camera zoomed out to um, 15 millimeter. So you can see with one lens, I can get two different, totally different looking imagery, images. Um, again, you need to uh, choose your subject and pick a foreground that, that um, is in the shallow water. Another thing, when you're, when you're framing these, the angle of your camera is very important. You wouldn't think it, but when you're looking through the viewfinder, you need to um, tilt your camera upwards a little bit and really frame it and, and move that camera around to, to get the right angle. Because it's just not, you know, pointing it and shooting it. You need to really look and get your composition the way you want it. It's very important. Okay, next we have Snell's window. What this is, it's, it's a phenomenon that's present on every dive. In reality, there's two versions of Snell's window. The one on the right is probably what most people are aware of, uh, familiar with. It's called refraction of light. When you descend down into the water, you look straight up over your head and you will see a circle of light with the perimeter getting darker and darker. It's almost like a vignette. That is referred to as Snell's window. It's there every dive. But another version or another type, I guess, is called total internal reflection. And what that is, that is when a person underwater can see something above water. So needless to say, it needs to be shallow water. But here on the left, those are mangroves, which is one of my very favorite things to shoot. Um, you can see the mangrove roots going down into the water. But then you look up, and that's what's above water. You can see the, um, the leaves. You can see the sky. You can see the clouds. So that's an example of that. And again, framing is, is very, very important. Here are two more examples of... Um, Snell's window. The bottom left, what I did here, this was called the passage in, uh, 
in Raja Ampat. And it was a, it was a, almost like a riverbed and the ocean would, would shoot through there. And it was just an amazing dive. Um, as you can see on the left, I, I used a little flash fill to, to, to light my foreground subject. And then as you can see at the top, we have a mangrove. There was a canopy of trees that was hanging over this real narrow passage we were diving in. And you can see the trees. You can even see the, the bark of the tree is like a birch uh, white. And then you can see the clouds and everything else. And then on the right, we have another example of the, uh, of the uh, Snell's window. Snell's window on the right, the example of that one, those will all be ambient light shots. So that's one where you're going to have the cyan color. You're going to have to meter the water and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I've really started shooting a lot of sun rays lately because I've been able, fortunate to do some at, late afternoon dives. And I love shooting sun rays. Um, it's, it's really, they, they, they can be kind of compelling. But the thing about sun rays is you need to... Uh, shoot them early in the morning or late in the evening when the sun rays are when the light is penetrating the water at a, at a lower angle and noontime is not a good time to to to, to shoot this the sun rays again to get something like this you need to be in shallow water um the right image at the bottom is a reef scene actually i just took this image of, uh, in january in in indonesia and i i lit i lit the the front part of the image as you can see with strobes and then i just the light in the background, and then the fish were swimming. Actually, the fish were swimming fast through the through the scene, which you wouldn't know. But um, and and when you shoot these images, you want to use a, a low ISO. You need to bump up your shutter speed to maybe maybe even sync speed, maybe two two hundred uh, one. I would a minimum of one twenty five. Sometimes 160. It just depends on, on what your sync speed is. Uh, two, I think it's 250 for what Nikon and, and mine is 200. Uh, and again, you can apply flash fill to, to the foreground. My aperture, you need to bump up your aperture to be able to uh, get create a depth of field, maybe F16 possibly. So you really need powerful strobes to do something like this because you're combating, you're, you're, you're fighting with the sun. So on the image at the bottom right of the corals, the horde corals, uh, my strobes were probably full power to be able to, you know, overcompensate for the sun. But there again, I'm probably within a foot under a meter, probably a half a meter from these corals. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to light them. Uh, hey, Beth, I think it's a good opportunity. I guess uh, there is a diver there. If you could mm -hmm. explain bit about the gears what all of these things are called oh okay good idea um okay this was our actually the the guy that was he's well was not the captain of the boat but he was uh he ran he ran the dive operation and we were diving together and this was a shallow water dive in um, raja ampat and as you can see there's his camera system my camera system's uh, similar but i have uh two big strobes there and actually my, my system's is bigger than that, actually. Um, you can see he's got fins on and then he has the jacket on the back. That's the BCD. That's what we uh, put air in and out. And that's what we get our buoyancy with. And we call that trim. So we want to trim. As you go down, you need to put inflate your BCD a little bit to get your buoyancy proper. And everybody has different needs. And it depends on your, I always wear a wetsuit. And a wetsuit is the covering for your body that um, keeps you from getting cold. And I have a tendency to get very cold. So I always wear a wetsuit and a hood. And th uh, this guy, his name's Michael. He doesn't have a wetsuit on. He dives all the time and he likes to dive like that. But for the most part where I dive, most people have a wetsuit. Um, and you can see, you can't really see his tank, but his tanks, if you look fair at his waist, you can see the back of his tank. So that's where his tank sits and the tank hooks onto the BCD. And then how we do it is, this was on a liveaboard trip. So you get in a small boat and they have all your gear sitting on the boat. And then you go out to the dive site and then they help you gear up and you put your gear on, on this small boat. And then you do a back roll into the water and then the 
the boat uh, person will hand you your camera and then you go to do your dive. And you can see the regulator in his mouth and that's what helps you breathe. Um, and then he has the goggles on, of course, to be able to see. And my goggles, I have prescription masks because my vision, you know, for distance isn't very good. So I have I have uh, special goggles that allows me to see distance. The same prescription that's in my my glasses here. Um, uh, let's see what else. That's that's about it. And there's like a, there's a we have a safety sausage we call it or a, or a, a little. You can see it on the right there. It's a little, little cylinder looking thing. It's a line. And what happens is at the end of the dive, you put that up, you deploy your safety sausage and you, you blow up this uh, colorful, it's usually bright yellow or, or orange. And then you deploy that to the surface when you're at about 15 feet doing a safety stop. Because at the end of a dive, we go up and we wait for three minutes and do a 15, uh, a three minute safety stop. And then your sausage, you shoot it up to the surface and then the boat drivers know where you are. Because, you know, some places we go, there's no boats around and other places we go, there's lots of boat traffic and it can be very dangerous. So we need as divers to be aware of that and deploy this safety sausage so um, other other boats and things can see us and know where we are. So not to drive over over us while we're, while we're surfacing. Um, his camera system, he has a mirrorless camera in there. He, I don't, he has a Sony, I think AR2 is his system, for those of you familiar with that. Um, and he is shooting strictly video. His lights there are um, video lights. And I have two video lights now that I put on in conjunction with two strobes. So, and he has actually has a monitor. You can't really see it in this image, but he has a monitor um, oh, for video on the front of his camera, which is which is very nice. Um, I think that's about it for, for that. You can see the different tubes. There's high pressure, low pressure, valve. You guys are interested in that probably, but um, it's, it's, it may, might look a little intimidating for those of you that haven't done it, but trust me, it, it's, it's wonderful. It, I love, love to be underwater. It's just so calming to me. And it, it's just, it, it's just wonderful to be able to breathe underwater like this so. another question or does that answer it pretty good no it, it, it was you know like i saw that picture i thought it's a good opportunity right no, now. That's okay. just anytime just because i don't think of that and you need to just jump in anytime i, I uh, sure. appreciate it uh, please continue okay um silhouettes silhouettes are very fun I mean, it's all fun to me. I, I love all aspects of this, but silhouettes are shot when you uh, place your light source, whether it's the sun, whether it's a strobe, most of the time it'll be the sun behind your subject. And it's really important when you do a, uh, to not blow out your light source. That's very easy to do because especially when it's the sun, it's so powerful, it's very easy to blow it out. So um, you want to make sure you don't overexpose your image because of, of those of you that are familiar with it, if you overexpose your image, you, you clip the highlights and there's no way to get back that information. So it's better on this type of thing to underexpose it. For silhouettes, look really good in black and white or sepia tone or a lot of times what I've been doing now, excuse me, for the uh, I've been desaturating it. I've been, you know, if it's all blue, I desaturate it like 80% and they, they really turn out nice because you can see more of the details. And when you're choosing to shoot a silhou silhouette, you need to um, have something with strong lines, uh, nice shape, um, and, and some contrast. If you get something too, like coral or, or something, it's, it's too much. It, it, you need some negative space. You need something with lines in it to make it a, 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 a nice image. And if you look at this image, this is another uh, example of Snell's window. This was actually, this was in Komodo, Indonesia, and it was my first time seeing. These are manta rays, and they're just majestic. I just love diving with them. And this was my first experience seeing them. I was in the middle of a channel waiting for them to come. The dive guy said, oh, they'll probably pass through. Well, I metered the water I don't know how many times, and I was so excited. He, he said, they're coming, they're coming. And I, I'm sitting there, I'm waiting there, I'm waiting. I was probably maybe... How many meters? Five, ten, 
three meters, four meters deep, not very deep at all. And I was so excited, I almost forgot to take a picture. So I, I only got two, two images. I, right when they flew overhead, I was like two, one, two, but it was a wonderful experience. Here's uh, two more examples of silhouettes. I always tell people, keep it simple, less is more. And I, I do believe that in a lot of things. And like I say, incorporating negative space is really um, something that you need to consider doing with your images. The image on the left, I took years ago in, in Cozumel, Mexico. I, I was doing a safety stop. We were at 15 feet doing our three minute stop just for safety reasons to get some more of the nitrogen out of our system. Um, I looked down and I thought it was a like a shark or a eagle ray or something, and it was me. So if you see that image, that's my reflection. So to capture a silhouette, you need your light source behind your subject. Well, my light source is behind me, even though then I'm the subject. So that's just a silhouette, but it's actually reversed. And that's the, the sandy bottom of, of the uh, Cozumel sandy bottom. And, and this is a part of the reef. But you can see my strobes. And then my, my feet, I tried to position them after I realized it was me I was looking at. So you could see my fins, but it didn't work. Anyway, but on the right there, that's um, it's in Bonaire in the Caribbean, and that was our dive guide. We were actually on a wreck, and I was down. I think it was 100 feet, actually, is where I was. Yeah, 30, what, 33 meters, I guess. And he was up overhead. So I, there again, simple compositions. An over and under shot is when you take um, one image and part of it is underwater and part of it is above water. Um, these can be pretty tricky to shoot because it's, it, it's the challenge is to get the bottom of the underwater image in focus and the top of image in focus. And different people have, you know, there's different theories or, or ideas. I like to take my uh, focus point and put it on something underwater. In this case, I see the starfish down there, the purple bluish starfish. I had my focus point on that. Typically, you want to do it a third of the way up from the from the bottom of the image is, is a good good point. And I focus on that. And then I, I bump up my aperture pretty high to maybe F16 because I want to create a nice depth of field. Because if I would put my focus point on the on the mountain back there, underwater would not be in focus. And you have to take a lot of pictures to be able to get both of them in focus because a lot of it has to do with the angle of the camera and um, um, water droplets. That's that's the biggest uh, one of the biggest issues you have with over and unders um, are, are water droplets because with I have two dome ports that I use for uh, wide angle imagery. I have a very small Zen port that I use for my um, my eight to fifteen fisheye, which I absolutely love because. My focus distance is only like a couple inches. I can I can put that that camera uh, dome port up right next to my subject. Um, but to do a dome port, to do over and unders, you need a big dome port. The bigger, the better. Well, I have a. It's not huge, but it's typical size. It's about an eight eight and a half nine inch uh, dome port. Uh, mine is um, circular. I mean, it's circular. Mine is acrylic. Uh, some of them are glass. My small one is glass. Glass has gives you a little bit better uh, optics, but it's very, very heavy. And I had carry so much gear, I cannot afford the weight to carry it with me. So mine is mine is acrylic, and you really have an issue with water spots when you have this. So what I do is I you can obviously you can see spit on the front of your dome port and wash it off. And I take sometimes reef friendly, which you really want to use reef friendly. Um, Shampoo, put it on my dome port before I go in the water. Then I um, rub it off. Another thing that I've heard, I've never done it, and I want to try sometime, is to take a potato and take a potato and rub it on the front of the dome port. And apparently the starch from the potato will uh, it decrease the water spots. But as you can see, these um, white angle, uh, and then I will just dip the camera in the water and then lift it up and take a picture. 
for me, this is kind of difficult because underwater, my camera is very easy for me to maneuver. It's a little negative, um, but above water, it's probably, I don't know, kilos. It's probably 30, 30 some pounds. So when I'm trying to lift that above the water, it's, it's difficult with the strobes. But as you can see, the fish eye, this is a regular fish eye lens and it, it, it it distorts it to some degree, but in but it actually looks nice. It um, it can create high impact images. These um, fish eye lenses, and they're good for over and under under shots. As you can see, there's more distortion on the above water than there is below water, and that's just the nature of the lens. This is another um, technique: uh, close focus, wide angle. This is when you take a subject and you force a perspective of the subject. On the left, this was a jetty, and then that's a big Gorgonian, uh, I mean, uh, soft coral hanging out. So that's my, my subject, really, and then my background is the fish. And you have to really be careful on this because you want to uh, have a nice background. And you have to really, again, check the perimeter of your image before you capture it to make sure you have no unwanted divers, unwanted bubbles. On the right here, this is actually a crinoid. And I don't know, if, this is a living, it looks like a flower. It's called the lily. Um, it's a living, it's a living animal. I know there's so many things underwater that's just amazing what is an animal, you know, and what is actually structure, but all this stuff is living, like all this, the corals, there are, are that's all living species. Um, this crinoid is probably, I don't know how, how big, to, uh, but I'm right on top of it. I, there again, I used my small dome port and I'm within probably an inch of that crinoid and I'm trying to fill the frame and force the perspective of this. And you can also apply this to macro photography. For example, you could take a small nudie brock, and if it's like perched up on a rock or something, you can get underneath that and get the background, or you can do it with all sorts of subjects. It's just that I was using my wide angle subject for this. And there again, you use a wide angle lens. You don't wouldn't use a macro lens to do this. You might shoot a macro subject, but you would use a wide angle lens, whether it be circular fisheye or rectilinear. A few um, quick little tips. Um, this is applicable probably to every uh, every type of photography. Um, trial and error is intrinsic to you becoming a better photographer and taking your skills to the next level. You have to um, get out of your comfort zone. You need to try new things. You need to experiment. Yes, sometimes you will fail. I mean, but that's the way we learn. We learn through our mistakes. We don't learn by doing everything correctly all the time. So I, I really encourage you to, to try different things. Take your camera, take control of your camera, shoot in manual. Don't shoot in automatic modes. I mean, it limits you so much. You need to learn your camera. You need to learn the menus. You need to learn how to do it. And I really recommend, do it above water. There's times I'll set my whole setup on my kitchen table and just practice just to, to figure out what I'm going to be doing. Because there again, I don't really want to be practice. I mean, I practice underwater, but some of this stuff can be done above water. And there again, I'm being a little redundant on the negative space, but I, I, I can't emphasize enough how, especially in, in underwater photography, how negative uh, space really enhances your images. And it's a welcome element in almost any image. Let's see. Uh, I have to say expect the unexpected because you never know what you're going to see underwater. You know, we're not at a zoo. Things aren't, you know, you're not going to necessarily see maybe what you set out to see. Um, this is a, a juvenile whale shark. I saw it in Tubata, Philippines. Oh, we, we didn't have any idea it was going to swim by. It was, um, I thought it was massive because it was the first one I've seen and it was like 15 feet, 16 feet. Well, come to find out it was just a juvenile. And now since then I've seen uh, whale sharks twice the size and they're just spectacular to see. Um, so just always keep looking around, you know, don't keep your head, if you, especially if you're shooting macro, 
I love macro, like I said before, but uh, look around, see what's uh, there. Don't always keep your head buried into the reef or into the sand. Again, get outside your comfort zone. You know, if you're good at shooting nudibracts or you're good at shooting um, starfish, do something else. Try something else. You can always go back to what you're good at doing, but try something else. It's very, very important. Because what's going to happen is there's going to be peaks and valleys. As you go through your photography um, journey, you will get better at certain things and then you'll regress. It's like anything else. Then we get a little bit better. And my, my uh, just stay positive. Just I always think of having keep your glass half full. All right. In conclusion, um, photography is a journey. Enjoy every step of the way. Uh, be a visionary. If you see it, you can shoot it. And slow down, relax, clear your mind, um, shoot wide angle, and enjoy the freedom. And that is the end of the presentation. And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thanks for listening. That's my, I have my website is BethWatsonImages.com. My Instagram, I just took a picture today because I'm really trying to gain Instagram followers. So if you guys are on Instagram, I would appreciate that. And I try to post something every day on Instagram. Um, and then my Facebook page, I post on fairly regularly, probably four or five times a week is at the bottom. So um, like I said, thanks thanks a lot. If you guys have questions, I would you know, would love to, to answer them for you. And if you ever want to send me a private message or you can send me an at message on DM on Instagram or on my Facebook or even get find me on, through my website. So I have a lot of stuff on there if you guys are don't have anything to do. I know this time is a little uh, you know tumultuous what's going on with everybody, but um so take some time and you yeah, know there's a lot of information out there. So yeah. Um yes, we do have a lot of questions. And one request to everyone, uh guys, please. Uh, show some love to this presentation. Please follow her. Uh, her Instagram handle is here. Uh, second request is, uh, guys, please, we are working for a cause. These all presentations, workshops, webinars are free of cost for everyone. Uh, please do donate to the Prime Minister Relief Fund or any other charity which you have. You can find link on our uh, web page as well where you have registered. Next is we have a number of questions here. Okay. Uh, uh, but one uh, one question I have maybe on the funny side, lighter side. Most of us we know Nemo fish, which is clown uh -huh. fish. Right. How have been experience? I saw some Im images in your presentation. So uh -huh. how had your experience? capturing them and I think they're most beautiful underwater. That's the first thing which uh, comes in mind, you know, the Nemo, the finding Nemo from there. <laughs> That's correct. Um, they, are, they are fun to shoot. I, 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 <clears throat> excuse me. I've shot them for years and I just, every time I love to shoot them. They have such personalities and they're very interesting. They're, they're on the anemones. If you look on my um, Facebook page, my profile, it's, a, it's Nemo. So it's an orange. I didn't have time. I was going to actually take a clip and put it on this screen. But it's an orange Nemo. Uh, the Nemo is orange and the, the anemone is bright green. It was one of the most beautiful I'd ever seen. And um, it's been one of my favorite images. And they are so fun to watch because... They have their pecking order and there could be one or two on an anemone or they could be um, five or six. And what's interesting, this is this is kind of uh, the anemones, they're all born male. OK, and then there'll be all the little anemones. They're all male. And then when the female dies, the dominant male becomes female. That happens a lot underwater. I mean, it's amazing some of this, the biology of it. And when you start to learn some of that, it even makes the stuff more interesting. But the, um, the Nemo's are fun and, and everybody loves them. And it's, they are fun to shoot. I have to say, I've got, I've got several pictures of them. Um, I have some on my website and stuff I've taken over the years, but 
they are probably one of my most favorite things to shoot. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, next question we have about a career in underwater photography. Like, any suggestion how you can oh, make career. it? Well, money out of that. I would encourage you. You you don't want, honestly in this day and age it's difficult to make have it as your primary career. I have to be honest. Um, years ago, I, I do some magazine work. I get, you know, I get paid for that. I, I, you know, images, I write articles. I don't write a lot of articles, but I could, it's not one of my most, um, honestly, not one of my most favorite things to do, but, um, you get, you do get paid. Some of the print magazines pay pretty well, but a lot of the online stuff, you just, it's more or less you contribute and then they will give you advertisements or, or whatever. But Honestly, you're not going to make a lot of money. It's, it's a passion. It's almost like a lifestyle. Diving is is kind of a lifestyle, if you, if you understand what I'm saying on that. And I just, I love it so much. And I like to share with people my experiences, especially with people that don't dive. They have no idea what's underwater. And people that dive, they have a relationship. They, they know what it is. But people that don't, um, they seem to really appreciate it. And when I share with them, they, they really like it. But as far as a career, I mean, you could be a marine biologist and then incorporate the photography on top of that. I know people that do that. And that's more viable. That would be a better avenue to pursue than just underwater photographer. You're, you know, um, it, it, you almost have to, to, to make it, uh, to, put, to put food on the table, so to speak, you're going to have to um, incorporate probably something else with it. Okay. Um, we have um, one more question. Like, apart from underwater photography, do you pick up your camera for any different genre, portraits, wildlife, or any other yes, genre? Yes, actually. I, I not as much anymore. I did um, years. I did a series of postcards for our. We live in a very beautiful. It's a rural area. We have a lot of streams. It's called the Ozarks. And there's a scenic riverway, and I, I've done a lot of, um, I've done some landscape, quite a bit of landscape stuff too. Not not in the recent years as much because I've done, I've been traveling a lot more. I mean, I was in Asia uh, last year, year before last, I was in Asia, six, five different trips. So, I mean, that's a lot of travel, and it's halfway around the world, so I have to get acclimated to the time change and everything. But in answer to your question, yes, I have done um, topside, and I really enjoy it too. Okay, uh, you are mentioning your Facebook page. We have opened it right here. So mm -hmm. Okay, great. Profile. You can walk through if you have any anything you want to show us, or we do see your profile picture as a Nemo pair. Okay, you see it. Okay. I'm sorry. Did you want me to do that, or did you want to? Um, we have. You can. You can yourself see it is there on the screen. Oh but no, I, I can't see it. I have to escape. Okay. Give no problem. But you do see. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Yep, that's me. 2011. He's showing my Instagram profile. That's me. Thank you. And yeah. I do have a um, which I'm going to eventually probably use. Um, I have a Beth Watson Images Facebook page, but I don't really post that much on there. Okay. I don't like to double post because if I post on my personal page and then I post on my other page, I post twice and I'm, I don't know. I don't, don't like doing that, but I'll okay. eventually have to, because I'm about, honestly, I'm about maxed out on my friends on my Facebook page. But I think you can only have 5,000 and I've got, I can take 20 more. I think there. Oh, okay. okay. Anyway, okay. but I really, the Instagram is important to me anymore because, um, and Facebook too. I I'll feel free because what I can do is go through and purge a few out. You know, if I ended up getting more people wanting to join my Facebook, and there again, I can start. If if I, if I have some interest, I can go ahead and start using my other page as well. Oh, great. Uh, we have another question mm -hmm. uh, from Hema. Uh, how do you get black background underwater? Okay, um, for for a uh, macro shot, the easiest way is to use a, a snoot. And 
what it is, it's, it directs the light and it, it makes like a, um, just a, just a, a beam of light. And then you hit your subject with it and you have to have a fast, fast enough shutter speed to block out the ambient light. So it's just like a spotlight. So I'm taking a picture of whatever. And I, I used to snoot a lot. And if you look through some of my galleries, on maybe on my website or even on Instagram, if you scroll down, you'll see um, uh, some of the images that, I, that I've taken. And if, they're, if it's a small macro subject and it has a black background, I probably snooted it. I, I for sure snooted it. Because I don't go in and like make the background black in Photoshop. When, I, when you see my images, it's technique. It's not photoshopped or what I do edit the images, of course, color correction and and so on and so forth. But as far as like blackening the backgrounds, I don't. And then for a wide angle shot, such as my manta ray shot, uh, I make it black and white. And then if you make it black and white, you can make the background black by making it black and white. And those are the, really the two ways to do that. Um, OK, thank you. We have a question. Why, uh, why do waterproof cameras have depth rating? And how long can I'm sorry, I? Waterproof cam I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Waterproof camera, what? Uh, this, uh, why these cameras have ratings for the depth? That how deep these cameras oh, you can find? Wait, depth rating. Usually they're rank rated to like a hundred meters, so it's not like you don't ever want to use it. So they're, they're usually the depth rating, unless you buy um, a very small, maybe a re really inexpensive camera, then they might not go as deep, but these cameras will go as deep as you ever want to go, right? You don't usually have to worry about that. What you have to worry about is taking care and cleaning it, checking the O-rings, because what they have is when you open your camera up, no matter whether you have a small system or a big system, point and shoot, digital SLR, there's, there's a system, they have an O-ring, and the O-ring is a rubber grommet that you put in uh, a channel, and then you close it up, and that O-ring is what keeps the water out. And that's when it goes under pressure, and you have to make sure that the O-ring is clear uh, of debris and sand, and that, because that's how you get a leak, all right? So that's your biggest problem. The depth rating is never really an issue, um, but it's, it's just taking care of your camera and make sure that you do good maintenance on it. Um, thank you. We have a uh, oh, okay. what is your new work next workshop? Excuse me, I'm sorry? Uh, when is your next workshop? My next trip? Uh, workshop. Any... A workshop. Oh, well, actually, I don't have one planned. I was supposed to maybe do one in, um, I was doing one in the Philippines in June, but um, obviously that got canceled. So I really don't have anything in the works. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to, um, when I go on some of these trips, uh, they want me to come and I may be doing a workshop next January on a liveaboard trip. And what I can do is um, I can, if you guys have a mailing list or reach out or something and I can send you information when I do do something because on these workshops, what I'll do is take a group and then we will uh, do hands on underwater. I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of teaching underwater as well as topside because, you know, I want to help people underwater, you know, with their stroke positionings with camera settings and so on and so forth. And then topside, what we do is we edit, we go through and we work in Lightroom, we work in Photoshop, and then I might do some presentations during the week, like every day, maybe 30 minutes, maybe on strobe positioning, on whatever anybody, need, whatever they want to learn. That's kind of how it works for me. Um, uh, okay. okay. Thank you. Actually, but I'll let you know if you're interested. No, I'll be glad to. I was not I was expecting not uh, that much of uh, people like we have our number of audience are full since beginning some of people okay. aren't able to join because there is a limit is crossed in this webinar so uh -huh. there is a great number of people good amount of people those who are interested in underwater photography as before this workshop we had been uh, like we had a little conversation that in india we don't have much opportunity because we don't have those resources but mm -hmm. 
a couple of people have asked like anything which you do near to India, maybe in Indonesia or uh, Thailand or some other country which are closer to India, uh, definitely would like to uh, uh, convey to our all uh, cheese user uh, mm -hmm. workshops, such events. So definitely would look forward for that. That would be uh, yes, I, yes. I would I would do that. I like I said. I think I'm going to have uh, something in January next year. It's going to go into Raja Ampat on a, it would be on a on a boat on a liveaboard boat. So um, I can let you know when I get that set up. Sure. Um, we have we we have almost uh, six more minutes to go. Okay. Uh, number of questions are there. Are many questions which are there. Would, would pick up a couple of questions here. Uh, sure. them, right. How good you are, how good you are in diving? Like, do you do diving only other than photography sometime for some other purposes? Or no. photography first? I, I, I dive um, to take pictures. Um, people say, oh, I'm not gonna take my camera and just enjoy the dive. Honestly, for me, if I couldn't take pictures, I don't know that I would dive. That's just my personal experience. Some people don't want to take a camera underwater. And what I'll say about that, if you begin diving, after you dive for a while, you need to do something. You need to um, uh, fish ID, coral ID, something to keep you interested in diving. Does that make sense? My interest is, is the photography and the videography now. Um, I love doing it. And there, I haven't been a handful of dives without my camera with me. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, one more question. Sure. What, uh, you have partially, you have answered, you have mentioned in your presentation too. This question is being asked a couple of times. Mm -hmm. The composition, are there some different kind of rules, different kind of uh, thought process you have when you are shooting underwater compared to when you are shooting the, on ground? Oh, yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, because you have a lot of different elements and things to take into consideration. You know, for one, your buoyancy. See this, this fish you have right here? That I mean, those corals are very fragile and I'm down laying almost parallel to those corals. You know, and I have gear, I have my, my hoses and I have things dangling down. And I have to make sure that I'm not hitting that coral. And sometimes you get so excited. I'm always excited. I honestly, I, I get excited all the time when I'm taking pictures. I, uh, I you, you have to um, pay attention to what you're doing. You have to know your surroundings. You have to know what's going on. And what I try to do on most shots, I look at something, whether it's macro, whether it's wide angle, I see the composition or I see the subject. And then what I do is I, I visually think, okay, this is what I want to do. And then I physically turn away from wherever I'm shooting and I think of what camera settings I want to set. Okay, so then I make the initial settings and I think of strobe positioning. So I make my strobe positioning however I want to do it. And then I go back, I get my buoyancy right to make sure I'm not, you know, I'm where I need to be. Then I go and take the picture. You know, it's, it's really important for macro because I don't want to, I'm like for that example, that last shot, that's beautiful coral hanging down. I'm within under a meter from that coral head. Okay. I don't want to be up next to that coral head, filling with my strobes, filling with my camera. I want to have all that set. You know, I might change my shutter speed and aperture a little bit, but for the most part, I want to have 90% of the stuff set up before I go in. Because I, I get too close and then I hit something or I get off, you know. So I don't know if that helps. And the same thing with macro. I see a subject. I'm like, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to shoot it. I back off. I set my stuff up. Then I get my balance. I get my buoyancy. I get my trim set up. Make sure my, a lot of times I'll take, this sounds crazy, but I'll take my tank and shove it and make sure it's centered in my back. Because if I'm off just a little bit, it, because I don't, put my hand down when I shoot, I control everything with my buoyancy. I have to say a lot of people don't do that, but I am able to go in 
get a shot and then I reverse frog kick out and then I can actually back up away from what I'm shooting. So it's just um, a thought process. That's the way I do it. And I find it works pretty good for me. So, um, Which brings to one question. You mentioned that you make sure that you don't damage or touch any of mm -hmm. such uh, items or creatures or anything which is there on the coral. Uh, what are the ethics you would like to convey that? What are the things we need to be ready? Because, you know, some of the things which you find underwater, they are so tempting. You think of bringing them with you. I know there must be some laws, but oh, as ethics, uh, like there's, there's a saying, it says, um, take only pictures and leave only bubbles, right? So that's kind of a lot of these places, it's a no, no, you cannot take anything. You can't take a shell. You can't take anything. I know I was going through, um, what was I going through? I was going through security at, I forgot where it was. I think it was in Indonesia. And there was a lady behind me and she had all these shells. Well, they stopped her at the airport and took all her shells because she, you know, you're not supposed to take it. And then they can see that on the x-rays. Right. And they and they don't want you taking anything. But and a lot of this stuff, the problem is you take it. It's so beautiful underwater and then you get it above water. And it first of all, it dies. Right. It's dead. And then, and then it decays and it just doesn't look like it does underwater. You know, the color, you know, the color is gone. And I have to say one thing, like, for example, this image you have up, that's a very shallow water. But the corals and stuff, some of the stuff you get to the naked eye is vibrant. But for the most part, it's not. So as you go deeper and deeper, you lose your color and everything is kind of muted. But I know from experience, if I put light on this particular sponge or this particular piece of coral, it might look boring and blah. But some of this stuff is the bright orange and bright red. And that's the color. I, I may bump up the vibrance a little bit in in. Photoshop or in Lightroom, but for the most part, these colors are the actual colors, and I'm not I'm not doctoring them up. And the trick is to get close, and then get closer, and then get closer to your subject. That's how you get the color. And for example, this shot that's up there, what I've done is I've I've created a homemade snoot. It's a wide angle image, so I don't want my dedicated snoot. So I take a sleeve of a wetsuit and I put it over my strobe. And then I direct that light onto this piece of, um, of coral, right? And then my diver, that's my dive guide. He's in the background swimming towards me with his light. And that's what creates the black background. I don't really do that in Photoshop. I just do it. It's technique, right? Great. Um, so it's almost time that now I have a last question. Okay. Uh, who do you follow? Whose work you get inspiration, and uh, your from where you learned yourself? You did mention that how you started when you got your first digital camera, mm -hmm. right? Um, but who is your inspiration? You look up to? I've got a lot of, of people that that really inspire me. Um, I, I'm self taught. I've never had a class. I uh, it's all trial and error. As I tell people, I can tell you what not to do. Because, what, because I've done everything wrong. And there's a lot of truth to that. Um, I, I have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of photographers out there that I, I really admire. Um, I don't know names off the top of my head, but um, uh, Ernie Brooks, he was a, he, he's, an, he's an older gentleman and he was very, very good. One of the uh, pioneers of uh, underwater photography and, and black and white imagery. His imagery is very, very good. He's um, an, done this for years um there, there's other people if you look you can see uh, even if you go to my instagram account or look on and see who i follow you can get ideas there um i've i've drawn a blank <laughs> on that but there's a there's a lot of people that have uh alex um alex lindenbloom he's a very good photographer he's he's uh he would work on liveaboards a lot of what happens is a lot of these people they work on the boats they work on liveaboards and they're they're underwater photographers and they're either maybe dive guides or they 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 run the boats or they work at the resorts a lot of my friends they live there and they do this all the time right a lot of you know i i, I go i get to go now more 
uh, three or four times a year now. But and I'm, I've been piggybacking trips on. I because it, it costs a lot and it's a lot of effort to go over there. So what I've been doing now is maybe going to two different destinations or going um, on a, a liveaboard trip and then a, a land based destination. So that's why I'm trying to maximize my my travel because it is really difficult to um, you know it, it's hard on, on on me to go over there because it takes what ten days a, a, a week for me to just get acclimated to the time change and everything. I think I've got a little off base on that question, but. Um. Correct. No, no, um, I guess uh, uh, we are having a lot of questions. Some of the questions are partially answered. So uh, the recording for this session would be available on the same website from where you, got, you guys got registered. We would be sharing also. Uh, certificate. Okay, I would appreciate that. Um, All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. I'm, I'm. Thank you for having me. If, like I say, if you guys have any questions or need some information, I will be glad to help. I really am. I'm here to help you. So. Uh, really appreciate that. And guys, she woke up too early because of us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> currently, yes, it's early. Uh, it was early morning for her. She woke up for us. We did some testing. A lot of background work. And really appreciate that doing this uh, webinar for us. And hope, uh, like, let's all pray that uh, uh, this lockdown will be over and uh, we will be back to our normal uh, shooting mode. And okay. uh, thank you, Beth. If you want to say thank something, you. please go ahead. Well, I just want to thank everybody for, for tuning in. And I hope you learned something. And I hope maybe I inspired you a little bit to. Um, if you're not a diver, maybe to give it a try. And if not, maybe you can just follow along and, and you know, maybe you'll find some other photographers to follow, even if you're not, a, maybe even if you're not an underwater photographer. And I want everybody to, you know, stay safe and, and, and healthy. All right. That's the main and thing. Guys, please follow her, please. Do donate I would something. appreciate the following. I, I really would because it helps me and when I um, create content for people. Because then, you know, I, I promote them. For example, as you can see on this picture, I do at Mermaid Liveaboards. And if you're ever interested in where I go or what I do, a lot of those links will take you to their pages. And you can go and explore further. Even if you're not interested in going, it's something to look at, something different. Right? Right. So I guess some of the followers are already increased. So you are on a little higher side now. And I'm sure awesome. more people will follow at the same time. Thank you very much, Beth. And I guess you I need to take care. All right. Thank Let so me know if I can do anything else in the future. All right. Thank you all very much. And thank you for being one of our editors in one of our issue uh, earlier. We did publish mm -hmm. your work. That's when we came in, uh, like we contacted you first time. And right. thank you. Very much. And guys, uh, thanks, Beth. You can log off. And anyone all right. else? Yeah. Well, well, all right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. And for others, if you guys have any question, I can mute you. Beth is not there, but uh, uh, I would be able to help any question you might have. Uh, anything related to publishing certificate, you can raise your hands and I would be able to answer you. Uh, if anyone of you want to ask before leaving this webinar. I see some hands now. Uh, let me see if the voice works. Or even after this, you can leave your questions to us. You have our email ID. And we are getting a couple of thank you messages. Thank you guys. Thanks for uh, joining us. It was a lovely session. I guess uh, voice seems not. Um, okay, we'll answer those questions. Please leave it here. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Tomorrow we will have a session on wedding photography followed by 
day after we have so our lineup is we have wedding photographer we have street photography we have a uh, couple of more like journalist uh, photography so a couple of more exciting sessions are lined up be uh, like you will get an email alert and if that session shows you please do join but make sure that you join before time uh, today also there were some people they were unable to join because we have a limited number of people those who can join this webinar thank you guys this is mukesh uh, from cheese photography magazine uh, thank you very much for being a part of the journey